Well, welcome everyone to the inaugural Hamilton Think Tank Community Conversations panel for the 0708 academic year. And I'm delighted to see such a, a great turnout this evening. It's going to be my pleasure and privilege to introduce a wonderful panel this evening. Uh, the title of our community conversations is Counterculture Campus. And this was an idea the students brainstormed last spring. And they were interested in exploring more of the cultural history of Eugene and, and really kind of Oregon in general. And so they, for the last two or three months, have been in contact with, and I hesitate to use the word institution, but a lot of the longstanding groups that have given Eugene its, its unique identity. And so I'm going to begin introducing the panel this evening. I'm going to turn it over to them because they've got some amazing stories and experiences to share with all of us. So on my far right is Linda Long, and she is one of our manuscript archivists or librarians, I should say, at the University of Oregon. She works in our special collections and archives, and she has worked for years collecting materials and exhibiting materials on the history of Oregon, and in particular, intentional communities and kind of utopias, uh, utopian societies in Oregon. So very fascinating work. And she's actually assembled an exhibit in the Living Learning Center. So if anybody wants to stop by the area desk, you can see two display cases with some of the amazing artifacts and materials that are in our special collection. So welcome, Linda. Thank you for joining us. Next to uh, Linda is Beth Little, who is the general manager of the Eugene Saturday Market, and she's just finishing her eighth season. And she also has an amazing uh, recording, actually filmed on 8mm uh, by a professor in 1972. And so you get to have a sense of what the Saturday Market looked like in 1972. We'll be showing that at some point this evening as well. So welcome, Beth. Uh, also, Susie Przansky joins us, and she is currently researching a book on the history of the Oregon Country Fair. And she tells me that she's already conducted 200 interviews with subjects for that research, and she has 200 more scheduled. So it's an amazing research project. She's been working on it for about four years, and she's actually interviewed some of our panelists for that as well this evening. So welcome, Susie. And to my immediate right is Ken Babs, a lifelong friend of Ken Kesey. Uh, they worked together for 43 years. Uh, Ken tells me that he's lived in Oregon since 1967 in the Pleasant Hill area, actually has eight children who have graduated from the University of Oregon, and one is currently a sophomore, so eight, eight ducks. Uh, so welcome. <laughs> so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to the panelists, and we're going to have a great evening. So thank you all for joining us. Okay, I guess I'm slated to go first. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, some of you may know that um, uh, several years ago in America, there was a big national movement, a counterculture movement uh, called the Back to the Land Movement in America, where uh, many Americans were um, uh, dissatisfied with urban living, and they wanted to get closer to nature and back to the land. So many of them moved to um, uh, rural areas and they set up many communities, intentional communities is kind of a broad term to describe it. Um, they uh, founded communes and uh, collectives uh, and it turns out that many of them were established in the West and as a matter of fact the majority of them were established in Oregon. Well an offshoot of that phenomenon was uh, communities set up uh, by women for women only, so they were separatist communities, and that's what I'll be telling you about today. When I arrived to work at the University of Oregon in 1996, I soon discovered that this thing happened in uh, Oregon, primarily southern Oregon, where these women established these communities, and um, I felt it was important to gather the records of these communities so uh, scholars could do uh, research on uh, the communities um, at at a later time. So anyway, here is what I'll be talking about. Down? Oh, okay. That's counterintuitive. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and now, well, basically I know what this says, but I'll give you a brief look at some of these communities and then um, tell you a little bit about, um, what, what does the next one say? Um, Yeah, I'll talk a little bit about uh, working with these women to develop the collections, and then if we have time, and probably we don't, but I could talk to you a little bit about some of the um, issues relating to privacy and confidentiality about those uh, records. So, um, oops. Um, here are two women who moved to Oregon fairly early in the movement in uh, 19, Jean Mountain Grove moved uh, to Oregon in 1970, 
She and Ruth Mountain Grove met each other in 1970 at a Quaker conference in Philadelphia, and they were immediately attracted to one another, but Jean had already made arrangements to move to a commune in Oregon near Wolf Creek. So she headed off there, and then um, they communicated with one another throughout a year, but uh, Ruth then joined her soon thereafter, and they um, lived together in a commune called Mountain Grove, and um, it was a heterosexual uh, commune, and um, they really they liked it enough to take their shared last name from it. That's how they got their last name, Mountain Grove. But um, and here's some uh, Jean Mountain Grove hugging a tree at the commune, and um, they they liked the living in a communal situation a lot, but. Um, and they were anxious to work on the land, but the men who controlled the commune wouldn't let them work on the land. So there was a lot of conflict there. Um, the men wouldn't let them use the two-man saw to do work <laughs> on the land, and so they solved that problem by going out and buying their own two-man two saw, but they called it a two-woman saw. And here they are using the, the two-woman saw. Um, the conflict continued, though, and eventually they were evicted from Mountain Grove Commune because of their sexuality. Um, then they moved to a gay commune that had both men and women, and there they started to publish this uh, magazine called Women's Spirit Magazine. Um, apparently, before this time, there had been no magazine or journal um, about feminism and spirituality. Uh, so they saw a real need to publish this magazine, and um, they, they produced it under crude circumstances. They had no um, electricity in their cabin on Golden, so they had to travel to other uh, homes and other places where they could type up uh, the magazine, and they had no dark room, but um, they managed to produce this, and we have all of these issues uh, over at Knight Library, if anybody's interested in following up to take a look at these. Um, anyway, um, they were, it was produced under crude circumstances, but they managed to distribute the magazine through the alternative press networks that had flourished during that time, and so it had a national distribution. And uh, it had a major effect on uh, women learning about these communities in Oregon, and it really um, uh, drew a lot of women to Oregon to settle in these communities. So there were other reasons why um, Oregon um, had a lot of appeal to women and other people settling in Oregon. Um, first of all, land was relatively cheap. Uh, another important detail was that the county building codes were really lax. So somebody could come to Oregon and buy a small parcel of land and then uh, throw up a small shack and call it home, and that was okay with uh, counties um, such as Douglas, Josephine County, and Jackson County. Uh, it wasn't that way in um, other parts of Oregon or other parts of the country. Um, there were abundant open areas for uh, women to settle and to live closely uh, on the land, um, and what's that last one? <laughs> natural beauty. And, and, and then, of course, the natural beauty of Oregon drew a lot of uh, people here. And so here are some of the travelers coming to Oregon. They came in droves, really. Some of them settled permanently and others moved on. Um, and here are some of the communities that were established in southern Oregon. This is just a kind of a handful. There were there are more than this, um, and here's a map of Oregon that shows a clustering of these communities down in the southern um, counties. Um, now back to Jean and Ruth. Um, they were also uh, asked to leave Golden because so many would come through to visit them because of Women's Spirit magazine. So uh, they eventually purchased a, their own parcel of land, which they called uh, Rootworks, which is just also near uh, Wolf Creek in Josephine County. Um, and here's a picture of the barn that they, they built there. And they had to call it a barn, uh, because, but they actually they, they lived in it, but um, they were a little bit more flexible in building it if they called it a barn for uh, building code purposes. Uh, and now here are some pictures of, uh, that we have in our collection of women uh, working on the land and having festivals and celebrations. Uh, and now I'm going to talk just briefly about uh, three of the communities. The first is Women's Share Collective, which was founded by, by five women, and two were Carol Newhouse 
and uh, Billy Miracle, and uh, they established this collective uh, down in Josephine County near Grants Pass. And um, here shows a lot of work on the land. Um, it was kind of like homesteading in the 19th century in a way. You know, they had to really take care of the buildings. They had to take care of the land. Uh, but women could come through and stay um, at Women's Share for uh, different periods of time. Some women would come and they loved it so much they would stay for years. Other women would stay for a few days or several months. Um, uh, the Women's Share uh, women also wrote this book called Country Les Lesbians, which also had um, a national distribution, and that also uh, had a major factor in drawing more women to come to Oregon. And here um, are just a, a few samples of some of the correspondence that could be found in the Women's Share records that we have over in Special Collections. Um, the correspondence is really quite extensive, and the collective was, was um, highly successful. And it still exists. <coughs> and another one, one of the earliest ones, is called Cabbage Lane. And here are some photographs of the women taking care of the land, moving a shack from one place to another. One time there was a flash flood, and so they had to build a bridge across the flood. Um, just typical things that you would expect um, uh, during, at, at, at like country living, you know. Um, here are some ephemera that we have in the collection for Cabbage Lane. Uh, another example is Owl Farm. Um, this was an important um, piece of land or community because although land in Oregon was comparatively cheap, it wasn't free. And so a lot of women would come out to Oregon and they did not have enough money to purchase a little parcel of land. So they could stay uh, at Owl Farm. There was a trust set up so that women could stay there. And in exchange for working on the land, then they could live there. Here's the original cabin at Owl Farm. Uh, some of the kinds of ephemera we have in the collection for Owl Farm, the handbook. Um, this budget for 1976 really shows just kind of how seat of the pants the operation was. This is a, hand, a little handwritten budget. Um, a newsletter. Um, somebody made up a cartoon. Um, all decisions that were made at Owl Farm were done by consensus, which led to a lot of frustration um, between the women. And somebody wrote up this cartoon to reflect that frustration. Um, some of the access issues that I have to deal with. Um, First of all, uh, in some cases, it was really hard work for me to convince these women that their records should be uh, preserved in a repository, like special collections at the University of Oregon. They were concerned about their own privacy. They really didn't want um, anybody looking at their records. Um, on the other hand, some women um, were really knew the importance of the historical record and wanted to make it available to researchers. Some of the women said, I will give you uh, my collection, my personal diaries, my, my letters, um, if uh, only women can have access to them, which of course is contrary to our archivist and librarian code of ethics, because if we acquire a collection and we make it available to researchers, then everybody should have access to it on an equal basis. Uh, so that stopped some women from giving us uh, materials, but um, others um, decided to go ahead. Um, I have to be concerned about uh, privacy rights of the individuals that are represented in um, these collections. For example, third-party privacy rights is, a, is an important issue. If somebody is writing a letter to somebody else and they're talking about a third person in the letter, then um, you know we have to really consider whether or not to make that kind of information available to researchers. Um, here are a list of some of the collections that I've already acquired in Special Collections and University Archives. Some of these are uh, already available. They're processed and organized and cataloged and accessible to all researchers. Some of them are not processed yet, um, and some um, have uh, some access issues to be worked out. But um, kind of gives a, a sense of the range of materials that are available to researchers. Um, and this is the reading room in Special Collections, so if anybody wanted to come over there and do some research, this is where you would go. 
It's on the second floor of uh, Knight Library North Wing, um, and you are all welcome to come and take a look at the collections there. The ones that I've been talking about are collected within the manuscripts grouping of materials there. Um, and that's pretty much the end of that. Of course, you know, you might ask the question, well, why do we care about this material? And we do care about it because, um, uh, as you probably understand now, there was this historical phenomenon that happened uh, in the state of Oregon. And um, the founding of these lesbians, lesbian communities is uh, a part of Oregon culture. And as such, we need to uh, document the fact that this happened. And if we don't have the, histor the historical record, then um, that record is totally lost. And that's why I decided it was really important to collect this record for future researchers. <laughs> How'd I do? Did I go over the side? No, it's great. Oh, good. Go for it. Go for okay. it. I'd like to go next because I'm going to talk about the Oregon Country Fair, and um, it considers itself an intentional community as well. So <laughs> that sort of fits in with mm -hmm. all of that. How many of you have ever attended the Oregon Country Fair? Uh, let's see, three, four, <laughs> five. How many ever heard of the Oregon Country Fair? Is there more of you that's heard of it? Okay, so this is good. I'm going to start at the beginning like I thought. <laughs> um, the Oregon Country Fair is a three-day cultural arts festival, and it's held every summer west of Eugene in the Vanita Elmira area. It started in 1969 as a fundraiser for a free structured children's school, and ever since then, the fair has been um, an intentional community created by people who celebrate the cultural values of the 60s, especially the values of cooperation, creative self-expression, and living lightly on the land. <laughs> it's going to be another theme here. The fair provides an outlet for craftspeople trying to make a living away from the corporate treadmill, and hundreds of volunteers gather each year to help co-create it. It has become an intentional community, a touchstone of a culture, a psycho-spiritual rejuvenation, and it's fun, too. The first fair was in 1969 and was a simple craft fair patterned after the medieval Renaissance Fair in Marin County. But the next year, Eugene Coffee Shop owners Bill and Cindy Wooten became the co-organizers, and the fair came to embrace a different Renaissance theme, a cultural Renaissance that celebrated new alternative ways of living. It's important to understand the context of the times when the fair started because the fair provided a safe haven, a brief respite for fun amid the intense uh, cultural upheaval and the anti-war demonstrations and other social protests that were rocking the country and Eugene as well. In the 60s and 70s, waves of young people moved westward looking to get real, to get back to the land. They were searching for a way to of life that was different from their parents' conformist lives. It's hard to believe now, but in the 60s, men nearly always wore ties and button-down shirts in public, <laughs> and women nearly always wore dresses and stockings. Um, I was in school at the time, and we had to wear dresses or skirts to school. Pants were not allowed. What was that? In Texas. In oh. Texas. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> we had that too in Washington State. Yeah. My senior okay. year, we could wear a tunic type top covering the major portion of the hips when we wore pants. So <laughs> it'd be like wearing a mini skirt with pants, which is popular now, but at the time it was Back sort then, of it was weird. Dorky. Yeah, it was kind of weird, yeah. So um, anyway, the, um, when women started wearing jeans and long peasant dresses and the young men wore open collar shirts or let their hair grow, oh my gosh, it was shocking. It, nowadays we wouldn't think twice about it, but it was radical. We've come a long way in embracing what was called the counterculture in the 60s. Many aspects of, city, of the 60s culture, the freedom to express yourself, uh, respecting the environment, the importance of communicating with others and cooperating to get things done, all of those values have become much more mainstream in those 40 years. But they were really radical concepts then. But young people were trying to change much more than a dress code. The civil rights movement was in full flower, and people were marching in the streets to demand equal rights for people of color and for women. The Vietnam War was going on, and there was a draft forcing young men against their will to fight a war they didn't believe in. And that gave rise to huge anti-war demonstrations. 
The University of Oregon in particular had been at the forefront of the peace movement. In 1963, the UO hosted the Peace Corps training, one of the first ones in the nation, and sent U of O suits to Nepal. When that group returned in 1964, UO President Arthur Fleming declared Peace Corps Weeks on, on the oh, excuse me, Peace Corps Week on campus in their honor. Um, it was also a hotbed of protest here. It was sometimes called the Berkeley of the Northwest for its uh, demonstrations. In April 1965, which is pretty darn early, mm -hmm. there was an all-night protest planned by faculty and students at University of Oregon. It featured um, Oregon's own U.S. Senator Wayne Morris as keynote speaker, included folk singing, a slideshow, and a midnight torchlight rally. <laughs> Over the years, the protests actually increased quite a bit in intensity. By 1970, a two-week student strike resulted in a 30-hour sit-in in Johnson Hall. Police broke up the sit-in with tear gas, and 63 people were arrested for disorderly conduct. In 1972, a peaceful protest ended up with a few people trying to torch the ROTC building with homemade firebombs. Interestingly, in light of today's political climate, those people who were arrested in that incident were charged with disorderly conduct and rioting, not terrorism. <laughs> All this time, a parade of freaks or hippies, a lot of people that back then called themselves freaks, were streaming to the West, and particularly Oregon, um, on this new Oregon trail. They came in their VW bands and their colorful converted buses. Um, in a Register Guard article in 1968, the U of O Dean of Men said that there were maybe a hundred hippies in Eugene, and maybe 50 of them were um, uh, students. By 1971, a follow-up uh, interview or a follow-up article on the hippies in Eugene estimated that there were 10,000 of them in the area, and the Register Guard counted 56 communes in the circulation area. So. Well, however good, 100, 10,000, <laughs> somewhere in there you get the idea that there's a, a big influx of people. So when Bill and Cindy Wooten came to Eugene in 1968 and opened their Odyssey Coffee House, they wanted to provide a downtown meeting place for all these people to come together and discuss the upheaval and issues of the day. Odyssey became a center for organized creativity. They had switchboard call center there where people could find a place to crash when they got to town. The Renaissance Fair's office, which is what the Oregon Country Fair was called when it started, the Renaissance Fair office was wedged under the stairwell. And upstairs, the Odyssey hosted Eugene's first indoor Saturday market on February 7, 1970. It was an experiment before it went um, prime time in um, May. As fair leaders, the Wootens hosted potluck meetings for fair coordinators, and decisions about the fair were made by group consensus. The group's vision was to live their values and walk their talk. They strived to work together communally, making decisions by consensus and to try a model of a different way of decision making and live. Mm, they tried to model a different way of decision making and living. The Wootens assembled a core group of about a dozen volunteers who went out to live at the property ahead of the event for a, a month ahead and start preparations. They're a relatively stable group of people in the 70s and they also operated as a collective. Discussion, disc decisions were discussed at length by everyone. There were no officers, and while in the end the Wootens would make the final decision, they usually were swayed by consensus. Also during those years, the fair acted informally as a nonprofit organization. After each fair, an annual meeting would be held, and people would vote on which nonprofits would receive the proceeds of that year's fair. The Renaissance Fair, as it was called then, became a safe eddy for like-minded folks outside the cultural mainstream. It was a place to lighten up, exchange ideas, and let their hair down. The fair's happening atmosphere attracted craft and food vendors, commune members, bikers, merry pranksters, activists and from many different causes, and people interested in the emerging alternative society. The fair continued to grow through the 70s. In 1974, a speaker's forum was organized by Ron Ekus, a former U of O student body president who had been very active in the peace movement. That year's speakers that Ron Ekus lined up included uh, Oregon author Ken Kesey, U.S. Senator Wayne Morse, and U.S. Senate candidate Betty Roberts. 
By 1976, organizers had to change the event's name to the Oregon Country Fair because the Renaissance Fair in California threatened to sue over the use of the name. Their idea of Renaissance was really different from what was happening here outside of Eugene. The country in Oregon Country Fair was chosen to honor the back to the land movement and the values of living lightly on the earth. Then as now, main stage booked regional bands who played folk, rock, and eclectic music. The outdoor stages attracted top new vaudeville acts, including the soon-to-be-famous jugglers, the Flying Karamazov Brothers, and Abner the Eccentric, Tom Noddy the Bubble Man, the Reverend Chumley. Many of their acts featured political and social commentary as part of their comedy routine. Wacky parades brought music, bright costumes, and merriment to the paths at various intervals, and fairgoers dressed in tie-dye and soft velvets. People got their faces painted. That was a good happening time, and it still kind of is. <laughs> in 1976, an appropriate technology area began as a showcase for living lightly on the land. It included composting toilets, a bicycle-powered flour mill, solar energy demonstrations, and other alternative concepts. In 1977, that same area became Community Village, and dozens of social outreach groups were invited to join together to model a cooperative society. Early village participants included growers co-op, beekeepers, and bring recycling. From the first, the village used consensus for its decision-making process, and they still do. I think that's about the only aspect of the fair that has stuck with consensus, because it is a difficult way to make decisions. In 1981, the appropriate technology group that had been sent to just one booth in Community Village said we didn't have enough room. And so they got moved to a whole new area that became to be known as Energy Park. They had room to demonstrate um, worm composting and solar water showers and again, the, uh, the, the ways of living more lightly on the land. Today, more than a dozen stages offer continuous music and entertainment. Community Village and Energy Park continue to showcase the values of the 60s, cooperation, helping others, living lightly on the land. The fair itself is one big playground where fairgoers can express themselves with costumes, juggling, performing along the paths. Mm -hmm. Forty years later, crafters continue to make a living outside the corporate world, and craft fairs themselves have become mainstream. The fair continues to stand at the forefront of event recycling, having achieved a 90% rate of recycling eligible materials and greatly reducing what goes into the waste stream from the fair. Looking back, it's clear those tie-dye, idealistic, back-to-the-land pioneers who helped found the fair did indeed create a cultural renaissance in the Northwest. Idealistic organizations with longtime fair ties still operating today include Whitebird Clinic, Growers Market, and Bring Recycling. Natural food pioneers have become mainstream successes, including the Springfield Creamery with Nancy's Yogurt, Toby's Tofu, and Rising Moon Ravioli. All of them have well-established booths at the fair. A collective vision for a cooperative event has transformed the fair into a magical reality each year. It's a place where aging hipsters, sacred tricksters, and their children and grandchildren still gather each year to celebrate community and find psycho-spiritual rejuvenation. Hi, uh, my name is Beth Little, and I'm the general manager of the Serenity Market. I graduated from a Quaker college back east in 1984, and my, hu my husband Tim and I bought a 1969 Ford school bus, took out the seats, painted it blue, and came across the country. <laughs> Three times, once in North Carolina, once in Georgia, and once in Texas, it was almost like a little mythological. It would get quiet, we'd be telling our story, and someone would look at us and go, you guys need to go to Eugene. <laughs> <laughs> and we did. And we got to Eugene after months of great adventure and travel. And within one week, one week of knowing no one in Eugene, we were living in an intentional community oh. uh, south of town. So Eugene just took us in. What, and we what down, down in down on Fox Hollow Road. So called? Fox Hollow Farms. Yeah, okay. So yeah. we so we so that was in November. And in April, we started selling our woodwork at the Eugene Saturday Market. So 
um, we found friendships, we found a home, we found a community of like-minded people trying to live life on their own terms with artistry, peace, and self-sufficiency at its core. Um, now, the Saturday market is in its 38th season. And in the way I envision the Saturday market is I can't weave together the Saturday market's counterculture without honoring its public marketplace model. The, par the Saturday market operates on the traditional pub public marketplace where people would pack their covered wagons or their, their peddler's wagons with their homegrown produce and their, and their uh, created uh, wares, their homegrown local wares, uh, and bring it to the downtown core to sell. There has been a farmer's market on the site of the present farmer's market since 1915. There, at, at that time, there was only two ways to sell your produce. You could take it to the retails where they would jack it up real, real high, or you could have a little peddler's wagon where you could go through the streets of Eugene and sell your stuff directly to, the, to the, um, your customers. Well, those people, that independent Oregonian spirit, uh, those people started, you know, rabble rousing a little bit. It's 1915. They're like, we need our own farmer's market. So they start a farmer's market after the city council and all the things that happened in Eugene now happened then. And uh, so it's 1915, 22 stalls. By 1925, 80 stalls. So it's happening. They're like, it's great. So then they get this idea, we're going to get a permanent structure, a permanent year-round farmer's market. It's going to be great. It's going to be great. When did they start it? They start it September of 1929. Yeah. Respectfully submitted, not a great time to start a market. <laughs> it's like, they're, gee, I wonder what Oops. other market we're thinking. Oh, the stock market. So it's, but also, what is a public market? What it, when you put it inside and put it under a roof, what is it? It's a store. It's called a store, in my opinion. So what happened was they lost something very, very precious. And that is something that I think all of us at the table, uh, it's about the relationship between the individuals and the constant one-on-one -on -one interaction and relationship. So when a person grows an item and a person buys the item, then next thing you know, the producer starts getting a relationship with the customer. They start producing to the customer. The sights, the colors, the sounds, the smells, everything in that public environment um, is a very uh, recharging. It's that direct relationship. So the type of individual that succeeded in that in that market had an independent spirit, an independent drive, um, and that and there was this uh, this constant one-on-one -on -one relationship and uh, a, a manner of respect that happens. So, um, uh, the they did build that permanent structure. Uh, the building still stands. It was at the corner of Charlton and Broadway, and it, it kind of eked its way out uh, by, I think, 1945, like 40. By 1940, there's 40 vendors, and it just kind of dies a sad death in like 1959. And so we had, then it's 1960. So there's no market. There's some farmer's markets on the, on the uh, fringes. But now this independent spirit of the native Oregonian and the Oregonian community is mixing with this group of people who either were from Oregon, Oregon but in many cases were actually traveling into Oregon. Mm -hmm. And this, this independent spirit is starting to m mesh, uh, sometimes smoothly, sometimes not so, with the, with the community here. S and there's a, also a very powerful artistic bent, a very, very creative and independent spirit. And this group of people, again, is not satisfied with the J-O-B. My, my husband and I used to joke, we'll spell that word in front of the kids. Don't <laughs> tell them the J-O-B word. <laughs> you know, there's, there used to be a joke, why do hippies go to Eugene? Because there's no work. Um, so, uh, so, so, we, um, so we have this community. They're independent again. They're creative. They're, they're, um, some of them probably are in these communes that we were seeing er uh, earlier. Uh, they're they're make, taking risks. They're risk takers, and they're creating. They want to create their own economy, and uh, they they are hanging out at the coffee house Aussie, and they they actually go to the city council and they say we would like to start a market outside, <laughs> and they get permission from the city council to go to set up a little market uh, in an alley next to what's between the deck and the. 
parking garage. In the parking yeah. garage, you know, <laughs> so they, and it rains. Of course. It's May 9th, 1970, and they, um, and they, 29 vendors come down there, and they stay all year, and by the Saturday before Christmas, there are 100 vendors. So the scene just, it happens right there. The scene is, there's always a place, and there always is a place to this day, on a Saturday between April and the Saturday before Christmas, where the community can touch and see and smell and, and, uh, and uh, have a relationship. So did it, we did that for a few years, went over to the uh, Wayne Morris Free Speech Plaza, went to the Butterfly Lot, I've got at the end of just a little six minute um, gig of the, of the market in 1972 on the butterfly lot, you'll see. Um, and you'll see some interesting, you'll, when you look at that, look for the posters of Richard Nixon, look for the posters of, of, for Bill Wooten, and um, interesting what you won't see, you won't see tie dye, you know. You, uh, so you'll, see, you'll see a lot of batik, you'll see um, candles and macrame plant holders and <laughs> and uh, you'll see a different kind of a thing the butterfly lot is called the butterfly lot because it's based like this so imagine that for like 15 years they had a market where everyone was like this it's <laughs> <laughs> and that's because it's that's for for drainage and then then they said to us we said let's see can we go can we go, you know, can you imagine all the whole time too, they're looking at the park. I'm just imagining it because I wasn't here yet. But they're looking at that park going, why don't they let us in the park, let us in the park, come on, let us in the park. Just give us, give us, give us a month. And they gave us one month in 1883. And that's where I, I hope you have been. And if you haven't, you have to go because it's well, almost done. Excuse me, where was the butterfly lot? The butterfly lot is where it is now, right behind the farmer's market. Oh, okay. It's that, it's yeah, that parking that structure. Is, I know it's right, you're yeah. right across from Wayne Morris. Okay, so um, it sat there and in 1983, and we moved to our current location. Um, so my day now, um, my day starts at about 5.30. My staff gets there about 4.30 and they start snaking down the lanes and they, f they flag the fountain and they start to put up the tents and the stage goes up. The food, co the food booths open the, the most, the earliest. Um, by the time I get there at six, uh, Dana is almost almost has coffee on. It's the strongest coffee because it's the first coffee. Um, but the, but you could get coffee at Dana's about 6:45 a.m. every morning on Saturdays. There's uh, Afghani has the special like Afghani uh, spices that they've got on, and the onions <coughs> and the the chilies and the garlic. Mm -hmm. So by about 7:30 or eight. It's really beautifully smelling. It's unbelievable, and the light <laughs> is starting to come on, uh, depending on the time of year. Then the artisans start to get there. You have to realize they've worked all we week long. So this is like, oh, you only work one day a week. No, they have to produce. They've lived life in their studios with artistry. They were living life on their own terms. They're creating their own economy. So then they, they put it up, and they put the village up. And the village all of a sudden happens. And there's about 180 craft booths. There's 80 farmer's market booths. We started together at Saturday Market, the farmer's market, but they're, um, and uh, understand that self-determination is a powerful force and a personal philosophy of, of how we live our lives, this, this way we've chosen to live our lives. So, and sometimes <laughs> the division in that way can be very difficult um, because everyone wants to have a voice. It's very important to all of us to have a voice. So at some point, the voices of farmers and the voices of artists, uh, we were self-determining our own agreements. So we are two markets now. We have two boards of directors. There's another manager, but we are sister markets. And, um, and it's an absolute unbelievable benefit to have them in the, in the spring the lettuce and the starts and the peas and then it starts to explode, you know, all of a sudden yeah. all the, f the tomatoes and the peaches and everything yeah. comes out and the fresh food, eating the food that we've grown right here, it's a powerful thing. Um, we always have a jam band or maybe a marimba band or a reggae band about 3.30, so if you've slept late, you can always go down there about 3.30 and know there's something really happening. It's still a place for like, the middle schoolers and the high schoolers still put their mohawks on and they still think it's a place to touch a touch point for fashion, to be individuals, to be independent. Um, and that's a powerful thing. One of the harder things is operating it. 
taking uh, 600 people and operating a place where uh, the economy can be pretty powerful. And so we talk a lot. We talk about ingenuity, we talk about design, we talk about what makes handcrafted, because we can only be handcrafted down there. So what does that mean? What does that mean in a world of technology? How can we take our philosophies of creation and take them into 2007? That's a challenge for us. We're constantly working with that. Um, we, we have a wealth of opinions, we have a wealth of suggestions, we have a wealth of criticisms within our own community. We uh, are very unique people. Uh, we are constantly in a continual process of growth, we're continual process of inspiration. We, uh, we're facing life's challenges boldly. We are uh, trying to transform our individuality into artistic form. Uh, and when independent people individual people form groups, um, uh, it can flow very beautifully and powerfully, or it can uh, just be trial and error. And so we, uh, in our internal group, decisions we'll make decisions, we'll uh, revisit decisions, we'll listen to advice and opinion, we change our minds and we uh, make agreements. We don't consider we don't use the word rules or laws in our internal Saturday market community. We just try to make agreements, constant over agreements. And this is the essence of community. Uh, seeing the beauty, seeing the color, seeing the defining what is handmade, uh, knowing that the process is precious. Um, we're not a craft show. We're not a juried art show. We're a market with roots. Uh, we carry the strong tradition of uh, independence, we are living, we are evolving enterprise of artistic individuals who uh, when we are charged with how we want to live our lives, we go to our garages, we go to our kitchens, we go to our studios, and we uh, create uh, what we think is more than a market. We think we're creating a, a real way of life and continuing a way of life that is, a, is by choice. This is not an accidental movement. This is an intentional movement made through a series of decisions through decades. So I don't know if it's appropriate to do. If you want to do it at the end, a little six-minute thing, but it's 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 a little corny, but it's pretty Let's cute. Watch it. It's six minutes. It's not too long, okay. <laughs> but it's pretty cute. It's 1972, um, um, and it's again on the butterfly lot. So you'll see that it's a little different than what you think of as the Saturday market. It has a funky soundtrack. <laughs> I didn't choose it.
<laughs> well, I can't sit and talk. I like to roam. Uh, this has been wonderful hearing about all this uh, uh, and about uh, these Oregon traditions that are so strong. Uh, first off, how many people here are not from Oregon? Oh, quite a few. All right. And uh, how many of you here have never heard of Ken Kesey? All right. Uh -huh. Well, uh, he's our famous author, primarily, uh, you know, with his books, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest and Sometimes a Great Notion. His escapades, along with uh, me and the rest of our gang that was called the Murray Band of Pranksters, chronicled in Tom Wolfe's Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test. Who here has read that? Okay, we're a good smattering of uh, different people here. Uh, this thing uh, we're saying about Oregon uh, with the uh, uh, independent spirit and the, uh, the desire to do things in a uh, different way, uh, to communicate with one another, to cooperate with one another, and to operate what has become known as under the asphalt. Uh, this thing they said in the 70s that happened, I was really part of uh, when we all came here from California, uh, California, and Kesey in 1967 was doing uh, six weeks or six months at a honor farm in uh, uh, California for a pot bust. And uh, so all the rest of us came up here, all the, our whole crew came up here uh, uh, with this bus we had called Further and settled on this farm that the Keseys had bought out in Pleasant Hill, 67 acre farm. And we actually had a little commune out there. Although we never call it a commune per se, it was just all of us still living together because for a long time we had done this. The reason this is really important now is because this is a precursor to the time that is coming. We're right on the cusp of a new time that is just like this. We're seeing uh, with the, um, uh, uh, the collapsing of the uh, housing uh, structure and uh, the fact that the whole monetary system is based on total uh, uh, imagination and myth and belief in that it's working. Uh, uh, but there can come a point, you can see it coming, where that will take a beating and these new ways of living and communicating and sharing and selling and dealing with one another and growing food together is a thing that all of you are going to be able to participate in fully because this mess that the world is in right now is yours to fix. And, in, and you have to look at it as being one of the greatest challenges of life. I mean, if you couldn't live in a better time, then when things get really bad, those are the best times because then you are free to use your imaginations, whatever technology you can continue to amass, and group your friends together. Uh, this thing that you said about the Saturday market and the farmer's market existing side by side but being two separate entities, it's the same way with the groups you form. We are now tribes within tribes, friends within friends, and you have to continue to form these groups and help one another out because we're seeing more and more in which uh, there may be not enough jobs for everybody, but maybe three people out of five in the group have jobs, and the other two then can do uh, the work that needs to be done around the house or this, that, or whatever. Okay, so, well, it's not Sunday, is it? What's with the sermon? <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> well, Kesey is not a native Oregonian. He was born in Colorado, but he came here at a very young age. Uh, and grew up uh, in Springfield and went to Springfield High School, uh, big uh, uh, opponents uh, sports-wise and otherwise of Eugene. You know, they called at one time uh, the, uh, the, uh, twin, the, the twin sis, uh, cities, the, and they were sisters, uh, and the sisters were the whore and the debutante. And uh, <laughs> you can figure out which was which. <laughs> uh, but it's not, it's, it's a joke just like everything else. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, Kesey went to Springfield High School over there on the other side of the river, and they're big opponents with Eugene High School, and so uh, Kesey was on the football team as a guard, and uh, the coach called all the plays, and they were playing Eugene. It was the last minute. Springfield was losing, and the coach, one of these tough, hard-ass coaches, you know, like these drill sergeants, you know, you need to do that, or I'm going to kick you from here to um, uh, Corvallis. <laughs> This is another curse on the land that we have to overcome. Are these coaches, these hard-ass coaches, they don't realize, Kesey always said, you accomplish more with the carrot than you do with the stick. 
And that is true in everything you do. And so now it's up to us parents and even the kids on the team who just will not put up with this from these guys, these hard-ass old farts that uh, are trying to relive their own uh, 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 sports careers, uh, climbing on the backs of these kids. <laughs> and uh, as much as I love Oregon and the football team, uh, you know, we see in a lot of the same stuff. But t getting back to Keezy. I keep, I mean, we're, we must be close to Sunday, huh? Is this Monday? <laughs> uh, uh, he, uh, the coach says, okay, we're going to go right into the line. And there's only a minute to go, and Keezy says in the huddle, he says, now, wait a minute. He says, if we go on the line, he says, we won't do any good at all. We need a touchdown. He says, let's fake the line plunge, he says, and go back and pass the long ball. Oh, God, they said, the coach will kill us. And they said, well, Keezy says, you know, there are, things, worse things than death. And everybody goes, what? What's he talking about? You know, and he says, yeah, he says, to lose to Eugene High School. <laughs> 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 okay, let's do it. So the coach is on the sidelines. All right, all right, yeah, there they go, line. No, no, oh, they're throwing the ball. No, no. Touchdown, touchdown, yay, yay. <laughs> and from then on, Keezy called all the plays in the huddle. The revolutionary steps to the fore, front right at a young age. Makes his move. Uh, he uh, then graduated. He matriculated. I imagine you've all matriculated at least once in your life. Huh? It's not a secret thing, you know. <laughs> uh, from Springfield, and he went to the University of Oregon. And uh, he was a wrestler uh, and a football player, but he threw his arm out. Uh, wrestling his shoulder, and he could never play football. And it also, she talked about the draft, which is another thing that was going on at that time. Everybody had to be something. And But Keezy then came up as 4F because he couldn't uh, throw the uh, grenades far enough, you know, to hit the uh, bad guys. They were always falling off and right there in the foxhole with all the buddies. <laughs> then he'd have to stomp on it, you know, to save their lives. <laughs> Close call. <laughs> Thank God he was kept out of the military. <laughs> uh, so, uh, well, he got he went to his boot camp when he went to the, the jail down there in uh, the honor farm in, Colo in uh, California. Uh, but anyway, uh, he uh, didn't major in English, uh, although he was turned on to writing by a short story writer. Uh, have you all read Hemingway? Oh, good. Anybody here who's never read Ernest Hemingway? Well, <laughs> I think you've got a reason. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so uh, it's a story called uh, something, Soldier's Home. And it's a double meaning because the soldier's home from the war, and it's a soldier's home where he's staying. It's his parents' home. And he's all messed up from the war. He's got this thing, whatever they call it, SDTS, XQZ, you know, whatever it is. <laughs> One of those things. <laughs> and... Uh, He's uh, there at breakfast, and his mother's there, and she's got the bacon and the eggs on his plate, and uh, she's down on her knees. She's begging him, please, uh, get a job, get out, get a girl, take the car, drive, do anything. And uh, we're going to pray together that this will be true and come to pass. Uh, please, please. And uh, uh, Krebs looks down at his plate, and the bacon grease is hardened on his plate. And uh, Kesey says, that's it. He says, I saw it. That was it. He says, the, uh, the story came to me. He says, the secret of writing came to me because Kesey was a magician. He uh, would uh, do uh, magic tricks at the McDonald Theater downtown between shows. At those times on Saturdays, they'd have matinees. And between the matinees, you know, all the kids were there, uh, they'd uh, have contests. Uh, you know, the thing about Kesey, although he was one of these revolutionary guys that worked under the asphalt, he was also a guy that operated on top of the asphalt and could work with anybody. That guy would deal with any single person uh, in the world. I don't care if it was the uh, highest monkey muck on Doonesbury comic strip or uh, uh, the lowest uh, guy on the gutter uh, uh, recovering from uh, a, a night freezing in the rain. He'd look every one of those guys in the eye and talk to them. And this is something you all ought to do. When you see somebody who looks weird, somebody asking weird, deal with them. Don't get too close to them. You don't want to get hurt, but don't ignore them. We're all here together, 
And, the, and, and that's one of the reasons a lot of people act so weird is because nobody will pay any attention to them. <laughs> and, uh, and the other secret that Kesey knew was the secret of invisibility. Now, this really is funny hearing this because as, a, as this group called the Merry Band of Pranksters going around on this bus filming and uh, uh, dealing with uh, in a crazy way with a lot of stuff, uh, he, uh, he knew that uh, you had to sometimes be able to walk through a crowd or through a scene and nobody would see you. Nobody would pay any attention to you. And that kind of gives you more power in the world than anything else. Now, I personally don't have anything against piercings or tattoos or any of that kind of stuff because, you know, it's the same thing. Everybody's body, you got the right to do whatever you want with your own body. That's the whole, uh, 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 what is it, the theory or the freedom of the drug use is what the hell <laughs> who says, you know. Uh, even that one guy, I can't remember his name, what was his name? Nailed him to the cross, that guy. He says, uh, <laughs> it doesn't matter what you put in your mouth. What matters is what comes out of your heart. So it's the same thing. But on the other hand, if you want to have this uh, secret of invisibility to use the cloak of invisibility, you, sometimes you want to put on the cloak of invisibility. And you all can think of situations you've been in where you wish <laughs> you had the cloak of invisibility put on and just off we go. <laughs> and nobody knows the thing. Uh, 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 so you don't want to back to the damn sermon again. <laughs> Let children, I'm telling you here straight. Uh, no, you got to do it this way. Uh, you got to not get the. Uh. Close enough. We get that channel on television. <laughs> okay, so we got Keezy. Always oh, learned the secret of writing. The uh, denouement, the epiphany where it's all exposed, because he knows that from magic tricks, where everything is built up, and then phew, the flower comes out of your ear and grows for three weeks, and you can't get it out of there. <laughs> <laughs> Poor thing. <laughs> okay, so meanwhile, he's at <laughs> the University of Oregon, and he's going through, and he's majoring in uh, radio and TV communications. And so at the end of the year, they got to do this thing about uh, – you know, a, what do you call it, a project or something, a recital. And so most of these people, they get up there, you know, and they do, uh, to be or not to be. That is the answer. No. Is that the, well, you know the story behind that. So <laughs> Kesey didn't do anything like that. He did a takeoff of this guy called Lord Buckley. Now, I know nobody in this room has heard of Lord Buckley. No? Nobody. He was this tremendous stand-up comedian and from Chicago in the uh, 60s who did these uh, raps, uh, hip, hip raps, hipsters, tripsters, and flipsters. And so, uh, but we got him on the records. Okay, we always listen to records. So we had him on the records. And so Keezy learned this whole uh, uh, Lord Buckley thing and came out in his uh, robes and uh, his, one of these little things uh, around his head, you know, made out of... Uh, bay leaves or something, and uh, he gets up there and he says, I was there, he says, at the day at the Coliseum when they're having the big bash betwixt the Christians and the lions, and here come Nero up the steps, and he had his bevies of beauties on each arm. And they were spraying him with perfume and feeding him the little nectars, you know, the ones that just melt in your mouth. And all the way to their seat, and as they're sitting down here across the ground, the floor of the Coliseum comes this Christian cat, lickety split, and going as fast as the poor cat can go, and right behind him is this big lion. And just as the Christian cat reached the wall and leaps to the top of the wall, puts his finger on the top right in front of Nero's eyes. The lion throws him down, gobbles him up. Oh, dead silence in the Coliseum. 178,000 people acting as if the Oregon Ducks had just fumbled the ball on the one-inch line. <laughs> Nero stands up, 
smack his hand on the top of the wall and says, Mark a golden spike where that cat blew. Nobody ever gets it. <laughs> it's the hip thing. See, at one time, hip was hip. But Kesey was the only one that ever told me what hip actually meant. Back in the day when they were smoking the opium in the opium dens and they were lying on those wooden platforms like six high, they'd be lying on their hip with the pipe in the mouth and smoking that opium. And so that was it, the hip. You had to be hip. So it was also a, a, a drug uh, kind of secret word, you know, to want to be hip, you know. Okay, let's go, let's go get hip. <laughs> Are you hip? <laughs> so there's a whole jargon going with it. Like after the uh, Coliseum rumble, uh, Neil and his bevy of beauties, they go down the sidewalk and they go into the automat. The what? The automat was New York's Saturday market. <laughs> New York City. You go on the automat and you put a quarter in the slot and you open the door and there'd be food being back there. They had one wall that was totally, the doors, the windows were blocked off. And so it was, guess what you get? <laughs> that was for the people who really liked a little excitement in their lives. Uh, but for the most part, you just went in and got your food. So anyway, here come Nero. He goes into there, and he puts the quarter in the slot, and he opens it. Or was it a drachma? What did they use in those days? <laughs> and they open the door. And he looks in there, and it's empty. And he yells back. He says, hey, man, where are the apple pie? This guy back there says, the apple pie is gone. Nero said, man, give me a piece of that crazy pie. I love it. Nobody ever gets that. <laughs> crazy, you know. Cool. Crazy. The one word, word that has survived through everything is cool. <laughs> How about cracked up? It cracked him up. Cracked Nero up. He goes out there laughing out the sidewalk and they're going along the sidewalk. And suddenly from the third floor come this big grand piano crashing down, dropped. <laughs> Nero says, Whoa, crazy, G sharp. <laughs> they always laugh at that one. <laughs> Everybody's a musician at heart. So, uh, well, we met at, uh, Keezy and I met at the graduate writing class at Stanford. We were both, <laughs> you know, going to be serious writers. Well, he became a serious writer. But as for me, I was in the Naval ROTC and had to go into the Marine Corps uh, because my health was good, uh, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> so while I was in there, he was riding uh, one foot over the cuckoo's nest. He got a job at the uh, VA hospital down there in uh, Palo Alto, and they signed him up for this experiment. He got paid 25 bucks to go in this room, and they'd give him a drug. And they never said what the drug was. But after a while, they realized some of these drugs are pretty good. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so uh, uh, they learned that when they got one of those drugs that made you feel pretty good, the doctor would come in and check you out. And how is it? Nothing. We, don't, we have to hang around here. You know, what's this all about? And, okay, go on, go home. And they'd go out and they'd be out in the street then. <laughs> Feeling real good. <laughs> so while he was there working, he went into this cabinet and got the bottle of the, of the pills, the one they were giving him, the Sandoz LSD-25, purest form of all. And this is how that came into our group. And so we became, uh, at that time, we weren't the Merry Pranksters yet. We were just a bunch of people that came around Keezy's on weekends and partied and talked and did crazy things. Like we'd sit up all night with the microphones on our stomachs listening to the sounds. And sometimes they'd <laughs> tell strange tales like uh, the things you had eaten many weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> Crying for help, let me out of here. <laughs> Tell me when it's time to quit. <laughs> uh, so where were we? Oh, we were learning hospital. new things. <laughs> well, and, and I'm telling you, because this is, these are the things now that we, that we all hear tonight 
will continue to do with our lives and continue each one of us hipping other people to, to the same things. So it spreads like a cancer, I mean, like a, a rock in a mill pond. <laughs> That's close. <laughs> too close. <laughs> uh, too close for government work, anyway. Uh, so, uh, but uh, Kesey found out that the CIA was behind the whole drug experimentation going on down there at the VA hospital, that they were trying to find a drug which they could give to prisoners to make them open up and tell everything. Now, I do not understand why they don't do that. I mean, what's this, this torture crap? Why torture them when you can give them some drug, make them feel real good, and have a good time? Give them some paint, let them do a little painting, you know, and uh, how about some music? Music instruments, play a little music. Yeah, because we found out that these are the things we like to do. We like to dance, we like to rap, we like to uh, get together with our friends and party, and we like to uh, make music, and we like to uh, do all these things, and we don't have to be professionals. The curse at that time, when you talk about the uh, button-down shirt and the dress and all thing, was that if you didn't succeed as an artist and have a show in a, you know, what do they have then, and, or a musician, playing the music or music. And a book writer, which you didn't get published in New York, or a dancer and you weren't with Graham Company and all that shit, well, I mean shucks, uh, well, uh, uh, you would, uh, you were, you couldn't do it. And I was a victim of the same thing because I was first chair trombone in my high school band, all state trombonist. And what happened? I went to college and found out Oh, I thought anyway, I can't do that, you know, when I'm in college now, you know, I can't be playing in a band. <laughs> but I really missed it and went for years and years. But finally I picked up the trombone again and played it. Now I play it all the time. And I can't understand for the life of me why I didn't bring my trombone with me tonight. <laughs> but they said I only had ten minutes. That was it. <laughs> so all of you here remember to do this. Exercise all these things you love to do and do them right in your house or wherever, uh, in your dorm room and that. Uh, one of the things we do in our own houses. And I, you know, this thing they talked about in the 70s, that we, I did this. I went and bought a piece of land and just slapped together a house and everything because, like they said, there were no building inspectors. But I did get the permit and so I could get the, uh, the well and septic tank in. But we've been living in that ever since, and there's never been an inspector there once because at a certain point, the county decided we were going to modernize and make everything Joe Toe, you know, the right. And so they threw out all the old ones. And mine was one of the ones they threw out. <laughs> so it's been great. And what am I doing now? I had to put a new roof on. <laughs> oh, my God. I thought this house would last longer than I would, but I thought, oh, that's not true. <laughs> but with the same spirit, we go ahead, slap it on there, paint it. You know, have some things growing on the roof, get the solar power in, do all that stuff. Our imaginations are our, are our uh, greatest uh, strengths. Uh, Kesey said all the time, he says, uh, the real currency of the land is the spirit. It's of the spirit. If your spirits are up and your spirit's good, everything, you'll get through it, whatever it is. And thus came drinking. <laughs> the spirits. Because Keezy used to love to say, yeah, he says, where do you think they got the word spirit in drinks? Because there is a spirit that goes in the drink. When you go out there and pick the, uh, the uh, grape and you mash it with your toes and you then uh, filter it out and uh, ferment it and make the wine, everything you've done has gone into that. That spirit is in that wine. That's why when you make the wine and you're in there tromping the grapes, you got the flutes out there. Stop it, stop something, stop it. See? And then you drink that wine. There you are. <laughs> uh, so, uh, well, so Kesey and I, we buddied up and we did all this stuff together. We had a gang. We uh, got to meet life people. Jack Kerouac wrote the book On the Road and his character, uh, uh, what the hell was his name? Neil Cassidy is his real name. But uh, we got to know him. He drove the bus. So we got to meet and, and groove with a lot of people, Timothy Leary, and got to be a uh, uh, kind of a roaming 
not really a minstrel show, but something like that, through all these different groups and peoples. Like the Kesey and I donated one day, we decided to get rid of a bunch of stuff. We had boxes of tapes and letters and stuff. We donated it to her library. And in 1969, when the Renaissance Fair first started, we were out there with the, the bus, and uh, I don't know if it was that year or the year after, but there was a tremendous rainstorm, and you couldn't get out of there. There was this ditch that went through there, and you, the, the, the fair site was here, and you had to drive through that ditch to get out in the road. <laughs> so it became the best part of the fair was the day after the fair ended. Everybody out there trying to get these rigs over that dish, ditch, throwing uh, uh, big, huge branches, cutting down trees, throwing them in there, and these things going in there, and everybody getting stuck, and then everybody having to go in there and get this one out and get it through. <laughs> Went on all day long. <laughs> and, <laughs> and she said about the uh, different uh, groups that were at the fair, she said the bikers, the bikers at that time were the uh, free souls. They're still around, but they're not like they were then. Uh, they were a real uh, a rasty group, but I don't know how that's ever happened, but one year they got to run a beer garden <laughs> at the <laughs> country fair. <laughs> I think that was after that was when they allowed no more alcohol at the fair. <laughs> uh. <laughs> so uh, then... Um, there we were in Oregon. Kesey got out of jail. We continued to do just what we're doing. Uh, the old bus uh, went to pieces, and we made a new bus. And Kesey was still writing. He didn't quit writing. He wrote a lot of books afterwards. And then he started writing these musical plays that we'd perform. We had a group now of about 20 people with a band. And we'd go all over the West Coast with this one called Twister. And then we went all the way to England, uh, the UK, all around uh, England and Scotland and Ireland, that with one he called... Where's Merlin? And the other thing we learned to do was to work the computer. When we went on the bus trip in 1964, we filmed and taped everything. And we were going to make a movie out of it, and this movie was going to be shown in the big screen. And we were going to, from then on, be filmmakers, movie makers. None of this petty shit, <laughs> writing, <laughs> typing. <laughs> no, we were going to make movies. So we did. We filmed and taped the whole thing, except when we taped it, we had on this reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder was going around like this, and it was run off electricity, and the electricity was provided by a generator on the back of the bus that we called the generator because it was always going. <laughs> and we'd piece and we'd be. <laughs> but that never, once in a while, it wasn't set right, and it would go. <laughs> and other times it would go. <laughs> and so. We came back after the bus trip, and we were going to do the editing ourselves. So we get the, the, uh, 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 s the film on this one reel, and it's going along 24 frames a second. Perfect. And then we put the tape recorder on it together. It's going along okay for a while. Uh, we're going through the south, and uh, oh, look at that, that beautiful sunset on the south there. Uh, it's going down over the oil well, wells and the bio, and the next day, you know, you're going to go over that TV. Easy. You better look back, there's a cop coming. <laughs> <laughs> so we were never able to match the sound with the film. And it was a total disaster. And then we got arrested. Uh, they, they raided the place. Uh, they found uh, Kesey hunched over the toilet uh, with a uh, handle down and this jar in between his legs empty. And uh, this guy on his back beating at him. And I come in there and he goes, what the hell's going on there? And I pick the guy off his back and throw him this way. And he tumbles right into the bathtub where Paige Browning's taking a bath. And whoosh, water goes splatting all over everything. And then whoosh, through the window comes this deputy with a gun and said, all right, everybody, knock it off in there now. OK, OK, let's sort this out. And so the guy comes out and he's spluttering. He says, I have, I have the papers, he says, the, the search warrant. And I take a look at it. I said, all the inks run. He can't read anything. And I says, this is not a search warrant. <laughs> you, guys, you guys have to go. <laughs> and then another guy came in with the real one. So anyway, we all got arrested. Kesey took the heat because it was his place. Uh, and then he went to the honor camp. And then we got out. Uh, and uh, da -dun -da -dun -da -da. the movie was there sitting 
And many, as Kesey said, tried to climb that mountain of making the movie, but all failed. <laughs> Until finally in about 93, where kids were coming up through the first computer, Apple computers in the high school, free apples and computers in the high school thing, and they were computer savvy. So they took us dinosaurs on and we got so we could do it. And so Kesey, Kesey's, Kesey's best thing is he's a storyteller. He's one of these guys could sit around a campfire and keep you, you know, entertained and uh, interested for hours. Uh, and he can do it on a stage and he can do it in front of a camera. And he could also do it with a computer editing these movies we shot. And so uh, we finally got out the bus trip, two versions of it, or two uh, reels before he died. And you can still buy them from his son's website. Now we have Blackboard here, I'll give it to you. So you have to remember, it's keyz.com, K-E-Y-C.com. Yeah, I'm sure you are going to remember that. I'll tell you what. I got my website on this card here, which all of you can have one of. And you can go to my website and link to his if you're interested in seeing this movie. And it's worth seeing if you're interested in this period of time, 1964. Uh-huh. So uh, we uh, were then this, uh, getting ready for our next big trip with the bus. It was going to be Cuba. We wanted to go to Cuba, and we were going to take the bus to Cuba, and we were going to do another musical play. We were already started on it, based on this Cuban poet called Jose Marti. Because in Cuba, there are so many factions there, the Fidelistas, uh, Fidelistas the uh, uh, Batistas, uh, the Ratistas, the Beristas, uh, <laughs> all the Tuz were there, the whole Tuz folk. But one pe person, all everybody in Cuba, at all times, will revere and honor is Jose Marti, the famous poet revolutionary who tried to throw the yoke of Spain off of uh, uh, Cuba. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. He went to Cuba to get water for his crew. They stopped and stayed for 400 years. They killed all the natives, crushed them like coconuts. There's not another original native in Cuba left. Imported slaves from Africa, treated them like dirt. And then finally, remember the Maine? 1898, the battleship Maine, this is the terrorist act of the other century, was in Havana Harbor and it blew up. Everybody cried, terrorism. Cubans and not them, the Spanish, were treating us badly because uh, they still own Spain, I mean Cuba. So we went in there with the Marines and we settled Spain's hash. We took over Cuba, we gave it back, all except Guantanamo Bay, which we leased for $100 a year for until both sides agree to, you know, to end it. And so even now, the <laughs> Fidel Castro, he gets every year this check from the United States. I guess it's not $100. It's got to be four or $500. And he throws it in this drawer. <laughs> so I don't know. How long has he been in there? I said 56. Oh, gosh, that's 50 years that he's been in, in charge there. So for 50 years, he's been throwing this, these uh, checks in this drawer. But as luck would have it, <laughs> as soon as one drawer got full, <coughs> he'd do the other one. And then another one. Then he needed another desk. So they had to put in another desk. So now they got this room in Havana, Cuba, which is nothing but desks piled upon one top of one another with the drawers all slammed shut with these checks sticking out of it. It'll be a national monument someday. <laughs> well, you don't believe me. <laughs> yeah, I tell you, that's why we want to go to Cuba <coughs> to find out if these things are true. <coughs> so. As a result of the whole mess, we're still, we've got this Guantanamo Bay mess. Now, this is one of the worst messes we're in. <coughs> so what do we do about Guantanamo? We consult Oblata. Oblata is the god of everything pure. He's the god of everything righteous. We'll ask Oblata for the answer. But how do we con contact Oblata? We call him on the phone. What's his number? Ago, 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 ai. Everybody together. Ago, ago. 
Ago ai. Come on, let's hear him. He can't hear you. Ago, ago, ago ai. Oh, he's coming in a little bit. Ago, ago, ago ai. Yeah, go, oh God, Almighty, what's happened to me? Oh, oh, oblata, oblata, I feel you coming. Uh, strike my heart with tendrils of tears. Oblata. Yo soy un compadre viejo y misimis non comprendo. Oblata has come into my body. His spirit is in me. It's the only way Oblata can talk is through, the, through a person who's come in like that. And his, what is it he says? Oh, he says, free Guantanamo. Return Guantanamo to Cuba. And then everybody in the auditorium screams, free Guantanamo, return Guantanamo to Cuba. And then we go into this really big, great musical number. Guantanamo a libre, Guantanamo a libre, Guantanamo a Cuba, Guantanamo a Cuba, freedom, freedom, all over the land, Arriba, all over the land, Arriba. But see, everybody's doing a different one of those. See, we could do it in here if you guys each wanted to do it. <laughs> but, and the reason to do it is because when we do that and we all join in on that, that's going out. It's leaving this room. It's going out into what they call the newosphere. The newosphere is an area up above us that you never hear about. Uh, they don't like to talk about this, but it's where every single word, everything that's ever said or thought is up there. And it's floating around up there. And when you get into the right state of mind, you can go in up there and tap into it. And so if we were to do that tonight, uh, you'll all have to have a drink of this first. We'd go up there, and we'd find out that this free Guantanamo, return Guantanamo to Cuba, is being beamed all the time. And now, our esteemed leaders in Washington, they haven't talked about this but once. And it was, we're going to close down Guantanamo. But so far, you've never heard anything about that again. But that, that's one of the main missions of, of our group, is to, is to raise the spirit and the consciousness to, uh, to close it down. And then return the whole base to Cuba. It's Cuban anyway. And we, there's a precedent for this because in the same war, the Spanish-American War, we drove the Spanish out of the Philippines, and they became their own place. But we kept Clark Air Base and uh, uh, Cuby Point Naval Base, huge bases. But since then, we've given those back to the Philippines. So you can quote me on this. It'll happen in your lifetime. We will give Guantanamo Bay back to Cuba. And to facilitate this, we're organizing a trip now where we take this stage truck to uh, Cuba. We're going to these amigos. They're taking this stage truck to Cuba. They're going to drive it to the base and set up outside the gates of Guantanamo Bay. These amigos are going to put the stage truck open. They are going to put the musicians on the stage truck. They are going to play music into, across the fence, so the prisoners can listen and be happy. Maybe. <laughs> All right, I think I've occupied more than enough time. <laughs> Thank you very much for your kind attention. <laughs> Did you live uh, near the Keezys on Perry Lane in that, was that a community where you lived? Uh, Perry Lane was a neat spot in, uh, in uh, Palo Alto there. It's actually right across the street from the golf course at Stanford. Now, uh, this was in 58 when we were there at Stanford in the graduate writing program. Ke I didn't live there, but Keezy and, and his wife Faye, and, uh, they lived right there, and it was a little community of cottages. That uh -huh. all were, and it was very counterculture. And all these people who lived there were all having something to do with the university, or artists, or uh, 
that. And so he was there. He lived there for two or three years. When he was riding uh, 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 Cuckoo's Nest, he lived there. And, but then they tore the whole thing down and put in houses, oh. regular houses. And Kesey moved up on the Skyline Boulevard between uh, Palo Alto and the ocean. And had La Honda. His La Honda. Yeah. And that's where, they, uh -huh. that's where we uh, left from the bus in 1964. Hey, by the way, if you go to my website, I got two great radio or, you know, links to uh, sound things. One is an interview Kesey did in 1999 with a uh, radio station in Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. And another one is uh, BBC Radio doing a uh, uh, poem by Alec Gisbert, which is called First Party at Ken Kesey with Hell's Angels. And it's kind of a literary program, which they, Ginsburg reads the poem, and then they ask a lot of people in the know, uh, you know, what the poem's all about, and, you know, and hip you to Ginsburg and all that. And so, of course, you know, <laughs> who was there at the time, the only one of all these people talking. <laughs> so, <laughs> they sent me, the fools, a CD of the program, which allows me to dump that into my computer, get out my microphone, and when that thing's cruising along and some guy's saying something about, yeah, he says, the kids, uh, Alan talks about the kids in the house. Well, they were upstairs in the bedroom. Uh, and I can come in and say, no, 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 there's no bedroom upstairs. The one-story house, they were, the bedroom was in the back. <laughs> <laughs> so keep checking my website. I'll have that for sale. <laughs> The acid test in Portland, yes. That was uh, quite a, a fluke of a thing. Uh, <laughs> I could really tell you a long story about that, but to make it short, we were going up in the bus, and we had the Grateful Dead with us, and we had uh, all their equipment and everything in there, and the uh, right rear wheel caught on fire. <laughs> yeah, it was an amazing scene. I mean, Pigman was back there, and he had three girls in the bunk with him. <laughs> yeah, one a black girl, one a, um, a Mexican, and the other an American Indian, and he was in there singing, Without a warning, you stole my heart. You took it up, baby, it tore it apart. You left me standing on the corner crying. I'm on my knees, I'm begging you please, turn on the light, turn on your love light, let it shine on me. And Jerry Garcia says, holy shit, the bus on fire. <laughs> <laughs> and there was this beautiful flaming arch, I mean, it looked like some beautiful rainbow of all these colors with the lines going up like that in it. <laughs> and the moral of the story is, I don't know if you ever heard of Andrew Casey. He's this famous seer of, uh, from Kentucky, and you can always uh, recognize him. He was a photographer, actually, but he'd always wear the seersucker suit. And uh, so he uh, had predicted that California was going to fall in the ocean. It was going to happen in the 60s because of the insidious, creeping materialism, consumerism, uh, 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 all this attachment to makeup and uh, looks and all this stuff. California was going. But, he says... It doesn't have to happen. If there is a change of attitude there and people start getting with it, you know, and, uh, and fixing the spiritual thing, you know, because it is sitting, it's, it, there's a fault to this, you know, the San Andreas fault. Everybody asks you whose fault it is. It's the San Andreas fault. That's, that's why we live up here. We're north of the fault. We live in a no-fault zone. <laughs> yeah, we do. We have no-fault insurance. Uh, so the beautiful thing of it is, that night, going to the Portland acid test, uh, Pigpen and all the rest of us, Pigpen turned on the love light. The love light was there. We saw it. And the love light spread. It went all out. It went down to San Francisco. It went to these groups like uh, Jefferson Airplane, uh, Who Do You Love, uh, uh, all these love songs that came out of all these uh, uh, groups. Uh, Big, uh, Big Brother, yeah, they had a love song with, uh, uh, what's her name? Yeah, Janet yeah. Joplin, yeah. And the Quicksilver, they had one, who do you love? <laughs> or was one of those guys. I don't know, I can't remember anything. Uh, that proves I was there. <laughs> <laughs> anything else you want to know about? Oh, I'll tell you what happened, though. We had to park the bus. We had to hitchhike to a phone. We had to get a, rent a rental truck. And we had to put all the stuff in the rental truck. And we all had to ride in the back of this rental truck, this big closed-in van, all the way to Portland in a snowstorm. Snowstorm? Yeah. How old were your kids during this? Were they born 
Well, my oldest kid was born in 1959, so uh, I was in the Marine Corps then, and so about that time between 60 and 59 and 66, I had like five kids born, and then we came to Oregon, and then there were three more, and all the rest had been born in Oregon. So, so did, they, did they ride on the bus when you were Oh, yeah. Well, they didn't, not so much when we were little. When we took the bus to uh, New York in 64, we were an all-adult crew doing an all-adult trip. So there were no <laughs> kids, no. They were farmed out to grandparents and stuff. But then later on, as we took the bus, we, and we, because the bus is a wonderful thing, Casey says, he says, my greatest work is the bus. He says, because I found that uh, it is a moving, uh, living piece of work. He says that you're right there, and it's dealing with other people in front of you. Uh, he, he says, uh, everybody recognizes the bus. He says, every kid that's ridden on a school bus recognizes this bus, even though it's painted. And come, they come running after it. I mean, in England, when we went to England, everybody knew about the bus. Not everybody knew about Keezy. You know, usually he's the, you know, the guy they all want to talk to, but they all knew the bus. <laughs> Did that answer your question? Okay, well, anyway, so we would go on places. Like, I remember one trip we took up over the awful Rottle Highway up from the Willamette Watershed over to the McKenzie Watershed. Everybody, all the kids are in there, and we camped out there. So we had family outings a lot. And they all went to England, too. Chris, I have time for one more question before we have to conclude the formal part of our program this evening, and then you're welcome to stay and have refreshments and chat informally, but anybody else has? Well, Katie, you can conclude our... Uh, where's the bus now? Well, the old bus, the original bus that we made in 64, kind of fell to pieces, and we parked it in the swamp down at Keezy's, and it was going to rust peacefully there forever. And uh, But then, for some reason, oh, well, then we made another bus in about 19... That went in there in about 69, and there's 70. And then in about 72 or 3 or something like that, we got another bus because we were going to the book, uh, National Book Convention in uh, Las Vegas. Keezy had a book coming out. And so he decided to get another bus, and we'd do it all together and get the bus. And the bus is a wonderful thing because uh, not only is it all of us in this enclosed space together, but we have earphones and headsets. So we're communicating with each other all the time, talking, you know, and rapping. And we've got this sound system, and we're playing these CDs, you know, and uh, uh, the music's coming through there, and it's coming out of the speakers, and it's coming out on top. And so we're singing and playing our instruments with the songs. This is one of the most fun to do. I mean, if you want to have fun at a party, give everybody instruments and turn on the and microphones and with uh, loudspeakers and that and, and turn on songs that everybody knows, you know, like, uh, I don't know. Rolling Stone or something, whatever. But it has to be something everybody knows. And everybody sings and plays to it. You know, and the guy can work the reverb, you know. It's more fun than anything. So we're doing this on the bus, cruising down the road, and we've got a FM transmitter in there, a, a uh, pirated radio station, a pirate radio station. And we got a sign that says, tune in to 105.7, K-Buzz. And uh, someone holds that in the window and these guys uh, come along, we're all talking to them. You see the sign? You turn the radio on. If you turn the radio on, wave or, or flash your lights. And pretty soon, within five miles, we got a convoy of people in front of us, <laughs> alongside behind us, going down I-5, <laughs> all listening to the radio. <laughs> well, please join me in thanking our panelists. <laughs>